um, our last talk of the day. Um, I'm going to be speaking on the Baltimore Orioles and the Rochester Redmen Exhibition Series. Um, how many people here grew up in Rochester? Pretty much everyone. Has anyone in the room not been to an Orioles exhibition game? A couple. Few, okay. So, I guess you're excused, Nate. <laughs> okay. So, um, what led to me wanting to explore this topic was I often wondered, you know, who played in the most exhibition games? You know, who had the highest batting average? You know, what were some of the, you know, quote unquote <coughs> exhibition career totals for the um, who played in the games? I obviously had good guesses on a lot of the stuff. You know, we know who were long tenured Orioles and um, whatnot. And um, then just also just kind of some of the neat anecdotes from the series and the stories from the different games and whatnot. So my method for this, um, much like Nate, spent a lot of time on newspapers.com. Um, and this provided me with box score level data. Um, fortunately for, you know, going, going back in time, even beyond a few years ago, the play-by-play -play data just isn't there for games. Um, so all the, everything I reference is going to be based off the box score level data. Um, there can be inherent flaws in it and whatnot. Um, so once I tracked down all the box scores on newspapers.com, um, created a database using um, Google Sheets and then uh, pivot tables um, to compile the career totals. So essentially what that looks like is you take the box score and you manually input all the data that's in the box score into a, a nice spreadsheet in a grid and then you can sort it and play around with it. Um, obviously, uh, and then once you get everything in the grid, you can use pivot tables, which basically allows you to sum different fields of the original spreadsheet based on a criteria. So for here, we would sum um, the top got cut off, the first columns is games played, seconds home runs, at bats. We would sum each of those columns based on player's name. And then that's kind of how we how we get to the uh, career stats for the exhibition series. <coughs> So we have a lot of places for error with doing, with doing it this way, and um, there's unfortunately no other better way to do it. Uh, first, of course, is the accuracy of the box scores. Um, you know, for the, uh, as they mentioned, he likes to check both the home and away box scores. Uh, for this, we really only had the box score that was printed in the Democratic Chronicle. Um, it was even easy to see errors within the box score sometimes there where individual players' hits wouldn't add up to the hits the pitchers on the other team allowed. And I didn't have a great way to rectify situations like that, so I had to kind of guess as best I could for that. Um, obviously, with manual data entry, then you're at risk for typos. I tried my best to minimize those. Um, alternate first names could sometimes pose a problem, so even something like Bob versus Bobby Gritch. Um, that's something that's fairly easily reconciled just scanning, sorting out medically and scanning mm -hmm. down the list to look for duplicate entries. And um, then players with the same names. Um, Mark Smith, there's a pitcher for the Red Wings in the early 80s, and there's an outfielder for the Red Wings in the mid 90s. At least it was a pitcher and hitter in that case, so that's easy to sort out. Um, and Mike. I think Mike Hart, and we, we had Mike Hart was our manager and a player. Yes, yep. Yeah, and um, then in fact, there was one time that it was around the late 80s, the Red Wings had uh, two Mike Smiths on the team. Yeah. Um, you know, one was white, one was black, and they each used their middle initial. But um, neither appeared in the exhibition series, so I didn't have to deal with them. But, um, you know, anything like that is obviously a place for error, but I think I got most all those, and certainly the, you know, anyone that would figure prominently figured out. So for a summary of the series, uh, the first uh, Orioles Red Wings exhibition game was in 1961. That was the first year of the Orioles affiliation with the Red Wings. Um, in the next 39 years, they played a total of 29 times. Um, interestingly, all the games were either on a Monday or Thursday, and that's a byproduct of how um, baseball builds schedules around the weekend. Um, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday are the biggest things, so teams are pretty much guaranteed to play on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So Monday, Thursday are going to be the off days for both, typically both the major league and the minor league teams when they could agree on a, on a date to play an exhibition. Um, they tended to go early in the season. Um, most common date that games were played in was May. 
Um, actually, I typo. It's actually five in June and August um, there. Um, I was surprised at how often they played in July, um, particularly in the early part of the um, early part of the exhibition series. Um, towards the end, um, you know, the last couple decades of the exhibition series, the Orioles were not willing to come to town that late in the season, and they were almost always in May. But um, early on in the '60s and um, even through the '70s, there were a lot of summer dates in there. Um, you know, that obviously have better better weather for the Wings and draw better crowds. Overall, the Red Wings won the series. They won 14 times. Orioles won 13, and there were two ties. A little under 8,000 people is the um, average attendance for an exhibition game, and a huge range on that from 3,400 to over 14,000. Um, very weather dependent. Um, seems to be about the biggest uh, biggest driver of that. I'll get into attendance more here in a minute. And um, overall, there were 501 different players that appeared um, in the Red Wings Orioles exhibition games. So if you look at attendance by year, um, not a lot to trend by this. Um, you know, the years on the bottom here was zero. Those are the years that there was not an exhibition game. Um, most of the high attended years, obviously, the two that were the last two that were held at Frontier Field, uh, some of the biggest attendances in Frontier Field history. Um, and uh, um, the 1966 one up there was one of the highest attendances in uh, Silver Stadium history. And that was a July day that had good weather. Um, a lot of the numbers that are here around the 5,000 fan mark, um, most of those wound up being that low because of rain and climate weather, um, things like that. <clears throat> There's also some wrinkles with the attendance. Um, over time, uh, ball teams have changed how they track attendance. Uh, so. Um, up until some point, I'm not sure when they switched over, they would only count full price tickets sold um, in the actual attendance figures. So, um, you know, here's a box score from 1959 where they had a family night, and with this they had 2,200 not whole gangers or kids, 550 women. <laughs> the attendance for the game is 2,100, and that's how many men were there. Men were the only ones that paid full price that day, and they were the only ones that got counted in the attendance. Um, you know, and um, throughout the years, there have also been different ways to track attendance. Um, it was much more common to track turnstile attendance, further you go back in time. Uh, sometime, I think it was in the 80s, they switched over to using paid attendance instead. Um, obviously, if someone buys a ticket and doesn't come, you still have the money, so you can justify reporting it that way. And it also makes it look like a bigger crowd than actually was there. And um, now it's Typically uniform to use paid attendance, um, you know, as the standard <coughs> report. But um, all the uh, all the attendance data that I presented was from the box scores, so it would have been whatever was reported by the ballpark by the ball team based on their practice at the time. Picked a nice box score. Yeah. Of the names I'm reading. Of yeah. Huh? All right. The other thing I um. I was curious about, about the time or the pace of the game. Um, you know, there's lots of uh, stories about um, players from the Orioles not really wanting to do this, just kind of come and let's get this game over as quick as we can. Um, and surprisingly, uh, I didn't find that the pace of the game was significantly quicker than I would have expected for average games at the time. Um, there was only two games that they played less than nine innings, and it just happened to be the first and last of the series. First one, uh, 1961, they only got five, in, five innings in because of rain. And um, the last one, they had agreed ahead of time to make it a seven inning game, again, because the Orioles wanted to move on. They wound up playing eight innings because it was tied after seven. And um, there were actually two three hour plus nine inning games. Um, and that was a 87 and a 99 there. Um, so if we look at uh, minutes per inning by year, um, you know, they were typically right between the 15 to 20 minute um, mark for minutes by inning. A uh, 20 minute inning, that would correlate to a three hour long game. And a 15 minute inning would be a two hour, 15 minute game. So um, you can see there certainly were a few games that trended <coughs> toward, 
you know, more towards that two hour mark. Um, but, you know, still quite a few games that trended towards that three hour mark for nine innings. And they were kind of in the general range for what we would have expected for baseball at the time in the, um, you know, 60s through 80s. And obviously, you know, currently we're kind of trending towards three hours as the average game. And obviously baseball is trying to do a lot to help get that back down. Um, unplayed games. Of course, whenever the schedule would come out, and I know when I was growing up, the two things I always looked for is when's opening day and when's the Orioles exhibition. And those were the two key dates to circle on the calendar. Um, so the 10 years that the Orioles did not come to Rochester uh, to play the Red Wings, um, in two years, the Orioles played an exhibition game against the International League All-Stars. Um, in 1962, they actually played that exhibition in Rochester. So I guess the Orioles did come that year. Um, but in 1970, the Orioles played the IL All-Stars in Norfolk, and um, as a result, did not come to Rochester for the exhibition game. Um, all throughout the 60s, there was a major league team that played the International League All-Stars each year, um, you know, at whatever city the International League All-Star game was. But the major league team varied. 63 and 64, the exhibition games weren't yet included in uh, Major League Baseball's working agreement with the minor leagues, uh, so the Orioles just didn't come those years. It wasn't until 1965 that it was actually put in the working agreement that the Major League team either had to go play an exhibition or provide a certain amount of money to the AAA team. 1979, um, we, the game was scheduled to be played, and it was going to be a great date. It was going to be played on August 2nd. Um, unfortunately, the American League canceled this on July 7th when the uh, Players Union balked that um, the Orioles would have been playing them 34 straight days if they played the exhibition game. And um, by the collective bargaining agreement, um, 19 consecutive days is the limit um, that major league players can play. And um, I believe that that's still the number today uh, for that. Uh, the Red Wings general manager at the time blamed Richie Jackson for this because um, Richie Jackson noted that the exhibition game between Columbus and the Yankees would have them playing, um, I believe it was a total of uh, 21 days in a row um, when they played the game. The uh, Columbus-Yankees game was played, and that was game number 16 or 17 in that stretch. But once they got up to the 20th game, the Yankees players went to the players' union, and the players' union filed a grievance over this. Um, which led to the American League canceling all the other exhibition games in the year that would affect that 19 game limit. And unfortunately, the uh, Orioles Red Wings were one of those. Um, there was also uh, newspaper reports at the time that the Orioles players were going to file a grievance over the exhibition game. So I don't think it's quite fair to completely blame Richie Jackson for this. I think there would have been a grievance anyways, but you know, he's the straw that stirs the drink. So, uh, Easy one, easy, uh, easy fodder. Um, part of the collective bargaining agreement for not coming to play the exhibition, the Orioles had to give the Red Wings $5,000, um, but they um, had a, would have had an estimated profit of $10,000 if the average attendance of about 8,000 people. Now, whenever I mention uh, estimated profits or anything like that, that's based on just what was reported in the Democratic Chronicle at the time. You know, the most common, uh, most common question for Red Wings management whenever the Orioles didn't come is, well, how much did the Orioles not come in the Washington Post? So, so 79 and the 80s were great for the exhibitions because um, 1980 to 1988, they all got played. Um, so 1989 had been scheduled for May 11th. Unfortunately, the Orioles had been rained out the night before, um, so they used May 11th to make up the game as part of the doubleheader. Um, and the Wings and Orioles had no more common off days that season, so it wasn't possible to reschedule the game. Um, by this time, the collective bargaining agreement, um, the Orioles had provided a $10,000 payment to the Red Wings, and our Red Wings management at the time estimated that they would have uh, profited about $25,000 had 5,000 fans attended the game. Which, um, you know, for early May, 5,000 probably still a bit conservative for it being an exhibition game, but. 
depending on whether it could be a reasonable guesstimate. Um, of note for this one, the Red Wings won the Governor's Cup in 1988, so there's going to be a big uh, ceremony before the exhibition game to provide the Governor's Cup championship rings to 18 players and staff on the Orioles that had been part of that Governor's Cup season. 1992 was the next year it wasn't played. Again, it was scheduled for May. Um, the Orioles canceled it on January 13th. Um, this was the year Camden, uh, Camden Yards opened. And um, they said that they wanted to use that day to get extra work in at the ballpark. So um, yeah, that uh, obviously was uh, not popular with the uh, fans of Rochester at the time. And in 1993, uh, again, the Orioles had a game rained out. Um, so the originally scheduled game for April 22nd had to be canceled. Um, so that they can make up the game. Um, you know, as uh, Chris Hoyle said, nothing against Rochester, but I guess you could say there are a lot of happy people in this locker room. Um, you know, as you can see, the you know players, it's considered a hardship to travel to Rochester on what may be a rare off day for them. Um, the game in, had initially been scheduled for June, but it was a change at uh, Orioles manager Johnny O's request because he just didn't want that so late in the season. Uh, the Red Wings proposed a make-up date on July 26, which was another common off day, but that was declined by the Orioles. And uh, what was going to be one of the most exciting parts of this game was Fernando Valenzuela was coming off the DL and was scheduled to pitch in Rochester. Um, so fans were obviously disappointed not to see him. Uh, Fernando Valenzuela did wind up pitching for the Red Wings, but on the road. So he's one of a handful of guys to play for the Red Wings, but never played in Rochester. 1995 it was canceled with the baseball strike. Uh, the season started two weeks late. They shortened the major league season, and uh, just didn't leave any room for uh, the exhibition games. And in, uh, in 1998, um, the Orioles played an exhibition game in Bowie instead of Rochester. Um, and uh, this is, you know, kind of one of the things that, um, you know, obviously lots of factors that led to it, but just another factor that led to the breakup of the Wayne Orioles marriage. Um, the exhibition that they played in Bowie was not against the Bay Sox, but was against organizational top prospects. And uh, they didn't have any Red Wings in the game because we had a couple players on the disabled list. Um, so our roster was only at, I think, 21 at the time of the game. Um, as you can see, I think Cal Ripken probably would have been happier coming to Rochester, so he wouldn't have had to have put up with birds or chasing them. <laughs> So those are, that's the, uh, at least the uh, latter of uh, five of these are uh, the horror stories of my youth, where uh, <laughs> you know, I didn't have an exhibition game to go to those years. All right, so for most games played in the exhibition series, uh, it turns out that there were six players that played in 10 or more games. Um, you know, obviously if you think of long tenured Orioles, you guys can probably come up with most of these games, and um, if you have Guessing the guy most of you are thinking for the 14 there is, will be who you're thinking of. So for 10 games, we had uh, these three players. And the one in the middle should be easy to recognize. Kind of a classic swing of Boo Powell. Um, one on the right here, uh, one of the original Mr. Orioles, Brooks Robinson. And on the left, a um, guy that you can sometimes forget about is Al Bumper. Um, both Bumber and Boot Powell played one game for the Wings and then the other nine for the Orioles. And Brooks Robinson, of course, played all his for the Orioles. Um, Brooks almost got to 11, but the 1973 game he missed due to illness. Um, Brooks Robinson uh, batted leadoff in the very first exhibition game and led off the series with a home run. So that was one of the two home runs he hit. His other home run was in a 74, um, so he had a Kind of nice bookends to his uh, exhibition series you know, here. The first at bat in the history of the first at bat in the history of the Orioles exhibition series. Um, another fun thing about the uh, '61 game is um, that we'll get to in a little bit is a uh, Hall of Famer actually subbed in for Brooks Robinson, and a Hall of Famer batted after Brooks Robinson. And I would be shocked if anyone here could name those two, those three Hall of Famers that batted in the first two slots in the first Orioles. <coughs> The career stats are listed here for uh, these gentlemen, and um, this is one thing that I was definitely surprised about is that uh, you know that Brooks Robinson you know went six for seventeen in the series, not a terrible average, you know it's right about three hundred, but 
um, you know, it was always my perception going to the exhibition games that, you know, pitches would get grooved to the Orioles stars and, um, you know, really looking at their career totals, that's not something I found. Um, there was really no Orioles star that put up gaudy statistics, so I really don't think they were getting any groovy pitches. All right, for number for 12 games played, um, someone who's often cited as a, being a reluctant participant towards the end of the Orioles exhibition series is um, Eddie Murray. And he played uh, 76 on the wing side and the remainder 11 for the Orioles. Um, he went a total of 7 for 24 in the series, and his one home run came in 1977, which was his first year playing as an Oriole. All right. Any guesses for number 13? For, for who has uh, 13 games played? I saw it. You did? Yeah, I'm your first. Oh, okay. So <laughs> yep, I think he snuck in there on the list. So it's uh, someone uh, high up in the alphabet. Yeah. Yeah, so Mark Belanger. Uh, he played for the Wings in 66 and then played another 12 for the Orioles between 67 and 1980. Um, he's actually the player that holds the most at bats in the series. Um, he had 35 total at bats, um, getting eight hits with those at bats. Um, he had three games of five at bats or more, um, including two of those with the Orioles, um, you know, which is somewhat unusual because, as we know, a lot of the Orioles regulars would get taken out after an at bat or two. So as you know, it's those three games that gave him those at bats to jump to the top of the at bat leader. And 14 games played. Any guesses who it is? Yeah, yeah. So Cal Ripken Jr. Um, you know, as I went into this thinking that he probably had the most games played, but um, wasn't sure. I was somewhat pleased to find that uh, Mark Melanger had more at bats because at least that was a counterintuitive. Uh, Counterintuitive finding. But uh, Cal Ripken played in 81 for the Wings and um, all the exhibition series between 82 and 99 with the Orioles. Um, he went 6 for 29 in the series. And um, 1987 was his best year by far. He went uh, 2 for 3 with both his homers in the series and half of his RBIs. Um, you know, so really, if you take out 87, uh, he was only 4 for 26 in the rest of the series. Um, you know, so if, uh, I think the Red Wing pitchers uh, missed the memo to uh, groove him some pitches to make the fans happy. And uh, while I don't have an accurate total on this, um, I think we can safely say that Cal also holds the record for most autographs signed during the exhibition series, uh, particularly towards the end of his career. Um, you know, he would be legendary for spending 45 minutes to an hour just signing autographs along the rally, um, you know, both in Rochester and every stadium he went to. It was interesting to look at the newspaper coverage. It was around 1985 that Cal Ripken really became the focal point of the coverage and remained so through the end of the series in 1999. Um, you know, he was American League Rookie of the Year in 82 um, and AL MVP in 83. But in 85 was when he was starting to get recognized for his streak because um, he was approaching a Brooks Robinson's Orioles record for most consecutive games played. And he also had um, his consecutive innings played streak going at that time. Um, the other thing that happened in the mid-80s was uh, Earl Weaver stopped managing the Orioles. So kind of the uh, face of the Orioles switched from Earl Weaver to Cal Ripken. And um, you know, he really became the focal point coverage for the last uh, um, you know, 10 or 11 years of the exhibition series. And it's interesting to note that when, when he was growing up in Rochester, he played Sandlot, yep. <laughs> probably less Call than a mile. Up. Yeah, right over less here. than a mile from here. Okay, so for position player MVP, um, obviously it was not a guy I was expecting, but uh, there was a player who went seven for eleven over three games for a six thirty six average. He had four home runs, including two home two two home run games in sixty five and sixty six. Um, not a guy who uh, many people would think of. I gave you some choices down here. It's actually the gentleman on your left, who it is. And anyone know who that is over there? Sam Bowens. Yeah, that's Sam Bowens. So, um, you know, I think that his uh, four home runs total are the most in the series. So no one else had more than two. Um, there was a total of, I believe it was six two home run games. And he obviously had two of them in back to back years. Um, Cal Ripken was another one. I don't recall off the top of my head who the other players were. So, 
I think Sam Bones is clearly the offensive uh, star for, even though he only played in three games, he uh, put up some pretty gaudy stats. For pitchers, um, there were two pitchers that pitched in four games and five pitchers that pitched in three games. Um, these numbers obviously are kept down a lot. The Red Wings roster is going to change over a lot more, and the players that have long tenures with the Orioles aren't going to be the ones that they're going to throw in the exhibition. So for three games pitched, we have these five gentlemen. Um, I would be surprised if people got more than one or two of these. Um, this is the one that everyone's most likely to get. Jim Palmer, yep. And uh, Brendan Hall of Famer Paul Mitchell is in the top middle there. But um, so the gentleman on top, John Flynn, Paul Mitchell, and Jim Palmer, they each pitched three, three times in the series. Um, and you know, Paul Mitchell later became a Red Wing Hall of Famer. Jim Palmer later became a Major League Baseball Hall of Famer. Uh, so Jim Palmer, his three appearances in 68, he pitched for the Red Wings. Um, this was uh, when he was working on coming back from injury. Um, he had pretty much that lost 67 season and mostly lost 68 season. And um, he actually got rocked in that start. He gave up uh, four runs in three innings. And um, talked about that with the media pretty much every exhibition game after 68. Um, and in 69 and 74, both of those times he was again coming off of injury for the Orioles, and uh, they used the exhibition game almost like a rehab start for him. The other two guys pitching three games were Earl Stevenson and John Welchel, um, neither of whom had tremendously uh, distinguished careers, but uh, you know hung around the Orioles system long enough to get in a couple of these games. All right, and then the. I have a typo here, but the two players that pitched in four games. Anyone know who these gentlemen are? Freddie Bean. Yep, yep. Freddie Bean's down on the left, and that's uh, Ray Miller on the right. So uh, Freddie Bean, um, he pitched in 66 and 67 for the Orioles, and um, at the time, he was uh, called up from the lower minors to start the game for the Orioles. Um, as a common practice, the Orioles wouldn't want to use one of their pitchers, so they would call up players from the lower minors. And then in 68 and 69, he pitched for the Red Wings, so he actually got in four consecutive exhibition games uh, with a total of 11 innings pitched. And, uh, Ray Miller uh, pitched three years for the Red Wings and uh, one year with the Orioles. Um, they noted in the, uh, in the one year he pitched with the Orioles, he was uh, coming back from injury. And uh, the Red Wings manager noted that uh, they knew that they were going to face Ray Miller that day. They just didn't know how many spitters they were going to see. <laughs> um, interestingly, there were three players that pitched a complete game or more in the series. Um, one of them was Gene Brabender, who in 1966, he pitched nine and a third innings in relief for the Orioles. Um, you know, clearly, they threw him out there. Uh, I think it was the fourth inning. And then he was going to finish the game no matter how long it went, and it wound up going 13 innings. So, um, and the Red Wings won in walk-off fashion. Um, Tony Chavez played, uh, pitched in 1976 for the Wings. Uh, he pitched the first nine innings of the game, uh, giving up seven runs, but wound up taking the no decision since it went to extra innings. And uh, Mike Boddicker in 1980 uh, pitched a complete game uh, victory for the Wings. And that's the uh, only uh, complete game that was pitched in the Orioles exhibition series. Lots of Hall of Famers appeared in the exhibition series. Uh, list on your left is the players who are already in the Hall of Fame. Uh, a couple people that I referenced earlier. Uh, Dick Williams subbed in for Brooks Robinson at third base uh, before going on to become a Hall of Fame manager. And uh, Whitey Herzog played uh, second base in the uh, first Orioles exhibition game for the Orioles. Um, this list uh, only includes people who actually took part in the games. Um, I included Earl Weaver there since he was a manager, um, but does miss some people like uh, Lee Smith, who was with the team in Rochester but didn't appear um, in a game. Uh, some possible names that could be added to this list are over on the right, and um, just went from who's been showing up on uh, some of the Veterans Committee ballots and um, things like that. So, um, of the Hall of Famers that did appear in the series. Um, the, despite the Red Wings, despite there having been, I think there were up to 27 Hall of Famers that have played for the Wings. I think it's right around there. 
Um, you know, the only Hall of Famers that have cleared in the Orioles exhibition series and played for the Wings at some point are Murray, Palmer, Ripken, and um, you know Frank Robinson and Earl Weaver managed the Wings but never played for them. So of the uh, you know of the dozen Hall of Famers that appeared in the series, it was really only five that ever played at some point for the Wings. The rest of only appeared as part of the Orioles team. So the uh, key figure uh, for the central part of the exhibition series was Earl Weaver. And um, if you were to look at exhibition games um, appeared in uniform at, he would supplant Cal Ripken as um, he was manager for 16 of the exhibition games, uh, the first couple in Rochester, first couple for the Wings, and then the rest for the Orioles. Um, he was also the focal point of the media coverage uh, from the early 70s up until the mid-80s when Cal Ripken uh, supplanted him after he got uh, replaced by Joe Altabelli in 1983. Um, yeah, yeah, my strategy is only good if my players come through. So Earl's always good for a quote. And uh, the picture in the upper left there, um, that they actually um, had held a uh, Earl Weaver look-alike contest. And uh, the gentleman standing on the right was the winner of the contest, and that's Earl on the left. <laughs> All right, reluctant birds. So like we talked about, um, a lot of the coverage uh, focused on how the Orioles would kind of be coming reluctantly. A lot of players didn't want to come. So Albert Bell up here, uh, when he appeared um, in Rochester, was actually when he was on his uh, media embargo. Um, so Scott Petoniak always tells the story that the uh, Orioles PR people um, pleaded with the media to not even try to talk to Albert Bell. Um, it had been weeks since he had talked to anyone in the Oriole media, in the national media, and um, he had a, could be quite surly at times, and the uh, Orioles PR people were trying to avoid any confrontations, so they were uh, really put it to the media, just please leave Albert alone. Um, he did that, one, did that once in the game, and uh, struck out on three pitches. <laughs> um, a couple of the fun quotes I found. Uh, 1965 was reported that the Orioles visited graciously, unenthusiastically, and with their minds somewhere else. <laughs> um, Hank Bauer, uh, that same year as the Orioles manager, says that he does wish he was home. He had a doubleheader with Boston coming up on Tuesday, and uh, that was one of the years that the game was on a Monday. Uh, Brooks Robinson, um, you know, didn't note the reluctance, but uh, tried to be a good ambassador. Saying I'd rather have been home with my family, but this game was good for baseball, so I'm glad we played. And uh, Paul Blair echoed a sentiment that was uh, shared by a lot of people that, you know, they would put on a good face that it's good to be back in Rochester, but only for a visit. <laughs> <laughs> What's Reggie's school say? I can't remember that. Uh, Reggie, ooh. Um, that was something about, um, he had um, held out the start of the season, and uh, the Orioles were about 10 games out of first place, and it was something referencing where if um, he hadn't held out, the Orioles would have been in first place. He was a free agent though, right? He yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it was before he became a free agent. It was um, when um, he was threatening to become a free agent, but he got traded to the Orioles. He traded him okay. Yeah, and he was unhappy with the trade. This was when the Oakland days were unloading all their top players. He was unhappy with being traded to the Orioles, so he held out and began their spring training and started a couple weeks late into the season. All right, so like we talked about with the coverage trends in the paper, um, there were almost every year of the series, there's pictures of somebody signing autographs. Um, you know, later years, it was Cal Ripken a lot of the time. Um, but, you know, obviously a big part of the Orioles coming to the coming to Rochester was for fan interaction. So autographs were a huge part of the exhibition series, and that was clearly reflected in the newspaper coverage. Um, they also tended to focus on players that had played with the Red Wings in this coverage, as opposed to Orioles stars that may have originated elsewhere. Which one are you with? I'm not in any of those. <laughs> Although I, there is, um, it wasn't in the DNC paper, it was actually in the uh, Canandaigua paper. I was um, in there getting Cal Ripken's autograph in the uh, last, last game of the series. Yeah. Um, another popular shot was on the well-attended games, that they would have uh, pictures of the crowd. Um, so, 90 cents, 55. Yeah. 
Um, so this was from um, the 14,000 uh, attended game in uh, 66, both the uh, lower left picture and this advertisement here. Uh, one thing that I found interesting was, uh, particularly in the early years of the series, the start times for the games were always either 7.30 or 8 o'clock, which, um, you know, we talk about start times now being late for the kids, um, you know, starting at 7 o'clock. Uh, the reason why they started those games so late is when the Orioles would come to town, they would first have dinner at the uh, Rochester Club. So the Orioles typically wouldn't get into town until 3 or 4 in the afternoon. They would go have dinner. Then by the time they could get to the ballpark, do some batting practice, they had to start the game at 7.30 or 8. Home run contests were a popular feature, um, particularly towards the end of the series. Uh, all the games from 87 on featured a pregame home run contest. Prior to 1987, I could only find it referenced twice in the paper, in uh, 76 and 77. Uh, the Orioles won all the home run contests uh, that were reported by team, and uh, Oriole players won all the home run contests that were reported out by player. Um, Brady Anderson in particular, uh, he would participate in the home run contest, but then not play in the game. So some players would kind of use the home run contest as a way to make their appearance and then take the game off. Some other interesting notes with the home run contest. In uh, 77, uh, Eddie Murray hit all the Orioles three home runs in their 3-1 victory over the Wings. Um, 1990, uh, Sam Horn was uh, with the Orioles after his hot couple weeks with the Red Wings. And um, he hit three home runs uh, for the Orioles to lead them to victory. Closest the Wings came to win in the uh, home run derby was in 91, but uh, Ernie Witt won it uh, with a walk-off home run. And um, Hoyle, in 1996, Chris Hoyles was a last-minute substitution because Brady Anderson was hurt, and uh, he wound up leading the Orioles with eight home runs in the derby, and uh, the Orioles won that one 14-10. Then um, in 1999, uh, Brady Anderson wound up hitting 10 of the Orioles' 16 home runs, and that was the highest total I could find reported for um, an individual player in one of these home run derbies. Um, of note, particularly in some of the early ones, in the um, 88 and 90 ones, um, a couple of, they would typically have five hitters that would hit three fair balls each. In at least 88 and 90 ones, uh, two of the Red Wings that did this were pitchers. So <laughs> they're at a little bit of a disadvantage. <clears throat> All right, so we'll finish up just with some anecdotes from the series. In uh, 1968, this was Jim Palmer's uh, appearance where he got uh, lit up for four runs in three innings. Um, interestingly, the only coverage this got in the Democrat and Chronicle was a column on page 4D, almost like modern times. Um, <laughs> And, uh, I'd take 4D to that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, the reason for that was the U.S. Open was going on at Oak Hill. So that was dominating all the media coverage. Um, interestingly, this year, um, the Wings had an off day between games in Jacksonville and Richmond. And they flew from Jacksonville to Rochester, and then Rochester to Richmond in order to play the exhibition game. 1966, this was the huge attendance year where they had more than 14,000. Uh, they roped up part of the field to accommodate the standing room only crowd um, that was over a thousand people. And uh, this was the only exhibition game that was televised. And uh, Channel 10 televised the game. Um, they knew ahead of time that there was going to be such a big crowd. Um, so um, they were able to negotiate the rights, and the Red Wings weren't worried about losing ticket sales, having already been so close to a sellout um, with televising the game. Uh, Davey Johnson had a great day that day. He was four for six, and uh, the game report noted that he fielded 16 plays at second base uh, cleanly and made one error. And uh, the Red Wings uh, rewarded all 14,000 fans that stayed when uh, Mike Fiore went with a walk-off home run in the 13th. Common trend uh, was to bring up pitchers from the lower minors uh, to pitch for the Orioles so they wouldn't have to use their own pitchers. Uh, this was uh, particularly pre prevalent in the uh, mid to late 80s. Um, in 87, they brought their uh, first round and third round pick from the year before. And in 1988, they brought their first three rounds, uh, their first three picks from the draft. And in fact, in uh, Greg Olson's case in 1988, um, this was his first time pitching after signing his professional contract. Um, he was supposed to be part of Team USA, um, but contracted mono, so I had to drop out of the Olympic team. 
um, but he actually made his uh, prof professional debut uh, pitching in the Oriole exhibition game. And, they, and did they send him to Newark? Yeah. He yeah. got played in Newark. Yeah, yeah after, the, yep, after the exhibition game, they sent him that down. And in uh, 1989, he wound up winning the American League Rookie of the Year award. A lot of times they would uh, stretch the rules a little bit. Uh, one of the biggest uh, violations of this comes in 1996. Uh, both Mike Devereaux and Jarvis Brown uh, rejoined the game after being substituted for it. Uh, both of their cases, they uh, it was because the uh, teams lost the designated hitter based on the switches that they made. Um, and when Jarvis Brown returned to pinch hit for a pitcher, Aaron Lane, he actually hit a pinch hit home run. So things that wouldn't have been allowed in a normal game, but with the exhibition game, they uh, let that slide. Uh, Jim Palmer, um, as we mentioned, he pitched in the three games. Uh, in 1984, um, he was released by the Orioles the day before the exhibition game, and uh, that led him from a, you know, to have to switch from modeling Orioles uniforms to a modeling jockey underwear. <laughs> you know, which he uh, made a pretty decent living after the next decade or so after being <laughs> released. 1983, the lights went out. Um, the lights were only at a third of power due to rain affecting some of the Transformers. Uh, despite this, they still played a full nine innings, and uh, no small part because uh, this was uh, Joe Altadelli's first year as manager of the Orioles. And um, as he quipped, he said, I hit 20 home runs one year under these conditions. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, had it not been Joe Altadelli managing, um, I'm pretty certain that this game would have either been at best shortened, if not completely canceled. Um, you can see the light tower there. There's a lot of bulbs, but only a couple of them lit. So, um, you know, is anyone here at that game? Does anyone remember that one? Yeah? So, how dark was it? It was, uh, pretty, it was, it was dark. It was pretty bad. He was looking at the amount of lights that are on there. I can't imagine that was an easy game to play in. And they did play pretty quick. This was one of the sub two hour games. <laughs> um, Two players had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days. In a 1974, Doug DeSensei made errors on his first three chances in the field. Um, the picture on the left is one of those errors. And uh, when he fielded the fourth ball cleanly, he received a standing ovation from the crowd. Um, it was also announced during the game uh, that uh, Nixon resigned uh, from office. So it's kind of an interesting historical note for that one. And in uh, 1984, uh, Jeff Schaefer said, well, if Doug DeSensei can do it, I can too. And he tied his record with uh, three errors in the game. Didn't find a record of him getting a standing ovation no. though after <laughs> he came cleanly. Uh, some sightseeing went on. Uh, Jim Fowler, who was a Red Wings player in 1973, uh, didn't get to the game until 20 minutes before the game. Um, they still put him in the starting lineup, but um, you know, he said he'd been in Niagara Falls all day and got caught in some heavy traffic coming back. So. Seemed rather forgiving of me by the manager to still put him in the lineup for showing up so late. But, uh, so it was. Yeah, there were no cell phones at that time to call and let him, yeah. let him know where he was. Um, some ambitions. In 1971, um, there's a, a large article in the Democratic Chronicle about Frank <coughs> Robinson's ambitions to become the first black manager. And um, as early as 1971, he was publicly stating that he was ready to retire if the opportunity presented itself to manage at the major league level. Um, you know, they, uh, Earl Weaver was obviously there in Baltimore, so they pretty much knew it wasn't going to happen there. Um, but surprisingly, the um, Democratic Chronicle mentioned Cleveland as a possible landing post for Frank Robinson. Um, but, and that is where he ultimately wound up. Um, but it wasn't until 1975 that he became player manager there. Um, and uh, you know, that was the first black manager in Major League Baseball history. And uh, a couple of years later, he became the first uh, black manager in Red Wings history. And three for the price of one. And in 1972, we had uh, Bobby Gritch hit into a triple play. Um, the Don Fazio, who still lives in Rochester, um, is playing second base. And he caught a soft fly ball going back into short right field. Uh, managed to double up Paul Blair at second base, and then Don Buford tried to tag up from third and got thrown out at home. Uh, this was the only record of a triple play that I could find uh, throughout the exhibition series. All right. So uh, some future directions that I'd be, um, you know, that I kind of came across and, uh, you know, may explore at some point in the future uh, would be to look at other in-season exhibition games that were played in Rochester by major league teams. Uh, RetroSheet uh, maintains a record of all in-season exhibition games, 
And there's actually been 65 total in Rochester history. Um, obviously, 29 of those were Red Wings. So there's 36 other times that a major league team played in Rochester that wasn't the Orioles versus the Red Wings. Um, a lot of those were the Yankees, who uh, took extensive use of playing exhibition games to market Babe Ruth um, as they would travel from place to place. Right. And that's what I have. Any questions? Didn't the uh, didn't the exhibition in '97 ultimately lead to Davy Johnson getting fired? The last straw because he fined Roberto Alomar because he didn't show up. It was definitely it was a contributor to it. Yeah. I know it was one yeah. of the last straws before. Yeah. So I guess he just didn't show up and didn't tell anybody he wasn't coming. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Robbie Alomar just um, he missed that game, and um, you know it was reported that he was ill. But, um, you know, he never, you know, it's more of a blue flu than anything. And, uh, you know, by that time, there was rumblings that Davey Johnson had kind of lost control of the clubhouse by that point anyways. And that definitely was one of the final straws to him moving on. When you mentioned the exhibition games, um, the Olympic team, too. Yes, oh. yep. Yeah, and that okay. would be in addition to the 65 there, since the Olympics were in a major league team. Okay. But in uh, 1984, the U.S. Olympic team um, played the Red Wings, um, in, as part of a tour while they were preparing to go to the Olympics. And that was quite a loaded team. Um, Mark in fact, McGuire. Yeah, Mark McGuire, Will Clark. Uh, Will Clark, who later played with the Orioles in the exhibition series, um, you know, amongst, amongst others, um, you know, were on that Olympic team. Right. Didn't the International League All-Stars play against the Yankees one year? Yes, yeah, they did. I don't remember what year it was. But uh, throughout the 60s, the International League All-Stars played a different major league team each year. And, um, was that game here? Was that what you were asking? Yeah. Did many of the Red Wings that were playing down here that were moved to the other dugout for the game and then go back? Not, surprisingly, not many. Um, typically, for any non-rostered players, they would bring them up from the lower minors. Okay. Um, you know, there were a couple that did that, um, pitchers primarily, um, but they would typically bring, you know, extra players from the little minors as kind of a reward for I don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, I want to ask what percentage of your information you would get from newspapers or from internet, but you're accessing the newspapers through the internet. Yes. But did you get some percentage of this from actual uh, a book or a hands-on newspaper, physical? Virtually, no. Virtually 100% of this I got from newspapers.com. Okay. So uh, newspapers.com, newspapers uh, those that are aware, it's a subscription-based service. Uh, they have uh, full online newspaper archives from hundreds of newspapers, including the Democratic Chronicle. But not the Times Union. Not the Times Union, correct. Um, all from newspapers.com based on the Democratic Chronicle coverage. Mm -hmm. How yeah. far do they go back with the DNC? Um, the back until like the 1870s. So they go yeah. Back. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah, the whole, they have the whole run. How much does it cost to get the subscription? I believe the, subs the, the subscription's around 140 a year, I believe. Yeah. Um, there's also several libraries that have subscriptions oh, okay. that you can go and use too. Like I think so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mondell still has hard copies you can go through. Yeah, and it's a it's a lot easier than microfilm. Yeah, or like it's anything like that. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys very much. For coming.